What's up, everyone? April Dunham here. It's time for another Template Tuesday. For this Template Tuesday, I'm doing something a little bit different. Instead of showing a Power Apps template, I'm going to show a Power Automate template, specifically how you can use Power Automate to help provision your SharePoint list for your Power Platform SharePoint-based applications. But first, here's the intro. I've got a lot of questions since I've been sharing these Template Tuesday videos and templates about how do you provision these Power Platform solutions that are based off of SharePoint list on the back end. Well, if you've happened to try to install any of these Template Tuesday templates that I've given you, you'll have noticed that I always include a zip file that is a flow which you can import into your environment. And the only intention of this flow is to build out the SharePoint list that you need for the template. So I thought I'd do a little bit of Template Tuesday Inception today and talk about how you can use this same technique of utilizing Power Automate to handle the provisioning of SharePoint lists so that if you have a Power App solution which you're using SharePoint as your data source, you can easily deploy that with this flow. Now, disclaimer here, this is something that I actually learned from the great Audrey Gordon. I noticed in the crisis communication power app template that was provided when I was installing it that there was actually a flow which Audrey built that would deploy all the SharePoint lists for you. And that was one of those things where I was wondering why I've never thought of that before. Because before that, I was using PowerShell to do all of that. Which PowerShell is fine, but if you're a citizen dev and not really familiar with PowerShell, it might not be the most ideal way to deploy these SharePoint list assets. So with Audrey's inspiration, I went into Power Automate and started building my flows to handle this provisioning. When you're using this technique, typically you would only provision these lists as a one and done type process. So the best type of flow for that is an instant flow. If you go to flow.microsoft.com to get to the flow portal and click on my flows and look in the upper left hand side and click the new button, you'll see all the different types of flows that you can create in Power Automate. The one that I use for my SharePoint list provisioning is the instant type of flow. This allows you to manually trigger a flow by selecting the manually trigger a flow option, either through the web portal by running a test and running it or through the flow app. Let's take a look at one of the flows that I've already configured that does the SharePoint list provisioning. We'll use the timesheet provisioner as an example. With our manual trigger option, the next thing that you'll wanna do is insert a variable because this is where we're going to put in the SharePoint URL of where you want to deploy these new list library assets to. And we'll use this variable within all the other subsequent actions to point it to the right location. This really helps us from a usability standpoint so that we don't have to go in and touch each of these individual actions and update the SharePoint list property. We can define it once and just reference all of these actions to this variable. Now, all of the rest of the actions are going to be SharePoint HTTP actions. So if you go add a new action, just search for SharePoint HTTP, you'll find this send an HTTP request to SharePoint action. This request is free and included within the Office 365 seated version of Power Automate. This is different than the regular HTTP request action, which is a premium. But since this is SharePoint specific, it's included in our licensing. We don't have to worry about adding any additional Power Automate licensing. So to handle this, we'll just make a series of HTTP calls to the SharePoint REST API using this action. You'll notice in this flow, we are using that action for the site address. That's where we're referencing our variable that we defined here to get the address of the SharePoint site that we want to deploy this to. And the method for this is always going to be post. If you're not familiar with working with APIs, you have to define different methods to call the API. And these methods define how you interact with it. And if you click the drop down, you'll see several options. A get method, for example, would be what you would use if you're returning data from an API. 
But in our case, we are wanting to send the API information and have it perform an action. So that would be a post method. For this first action, we want to create a list called bill to. So we're going to call the list endpoint in SharePoint REST API using this URL. For all of these actions, we need two standard headers in here, one for accept with this application JSON information in it, and one for content type with that same application JSON text. Then we get to the body, which is where we actually tell it what we want it to do. The only thing that you'll need to know to change within this JSON block here is the base template, the title, and the description. This metadata is standard for the REST call to let it know that we're creating a SharePoint list. The other thing you can change is allow content types. I have it set to true. The default's false, uh, but I like having the ability to manage the content types of my list, so I always set that to true. Base template is where you define what type of SharePoint list or library you're creating. Here I'm using base template 100, which is a basic custom SharePoint list. That gives us a blank canvas that we can customize. If you want a SharePoint library to store documents, you would use base template of 101. The description and title are pretty self-explanatory. Put the name of your list and description in those areas. So this HTTP action is going to create a custom SharePoint list called build to for us. Now we need to create the columns that should be within that list because the blank SharePoint list type only gives you one column called title. So that's what we're doing in these next steps. You see here, we're creating a column called week start. We're using the post method again, but the URI this time is different. Instead of calling the list endpoint, we're using the get by title method, passing it in the name of the list, and then using the fields property. So within here, when you're using this, you'll need to change the value that's in here to the name of the list that you want to add this column into. Your headers are going to be the same as when we created the list itself, but of course the body is going to be different this time. This metadata information will be standard, but the two things that you'll always change in this is the field type kind in the title. The title being the name of the column that you want to create, and the field type kind is the type of column. These are stored as numbers, so you have to know what the numbers are for each field type kind in SharePoint. So a single line of text, multi-line of text, choice, all of those different types of fields you can create, each have an associated number. Now, how do you know what those numbers are, you ask? Well, you have to research the SharePoint API documentation to find out what these values are. But I tried to make that easy for you, and I've created a corresponding blog post and highlighted some of the most common column types that you might want to create to give you the code that you would need in the body with that field type kind for the associated columns. So as you can see, single line of text is a field type kind of two, multi-line is three, and date time is four, and so on and so forth. So hopefully this will really help you out if you're wanting to use this technique to deploy your SharePoint list. You can just copy this code from here for the type of field you're wanting to create and paste it into the body of your HTTP SharePoint action. So all you need to do is repeat that, keep adding in these SharePoint HTTP actions for each field that you want and updating the body for the appropriate field type kind and name. And the last thing is optional. By default, when we add these, it's not going to add those to the view of the list. So if we jump over to SharePoint, you'll see what I'm talking about. When you create a SharePoint list, you have to specify the view, which is what shows up here, the information that's showing across the screen. And then you, of course, you have your form. So if you click new, that's the fields that show. Well, what we've built so far by making those HTTP requests to create the list in the columns, it's going to make it to where those fields show up here on the form, but they're not going to show across the screen on the view unless you do an extra step. If we scroll down, you see I'm initializing another variable below all this called reservations field names, and I'm using a type of an array instead of a string like we did before. And in that, I'm going to list all of the columns that I might want to add in the default view. So all the ones we created up here, I'm adding those and just hard coding those into this array. And then next we'll want to loop through the array and perform one more HTTP SharePoint action. 
So that's what I'm doing here with this apply to each. I'm pointing it to my array and we have another SharePoint HTTP action, which is a post. And you'll see the URI is very different for this. So we're going to call the list endpoint, get by title again, pass it in the name of the list that you want to update the view for. Then we're using the views function and we're going to get the view that we want to update by passing in the name. So typically you'd want to do this on the default view, which is called all items. Now there's a space in the name. So that's why we have a percent 20 there. And then you'll go into the view fields and use the add view field method. And we'll just pass in the current item that we're in in the array. So Monday through status, which we have in the array. And that will ensure that these columns are added to the default view. If you have any other ideas for templates that you'd like me to showcase in this Template Tuesday series, please drop me a message here in the comments. Hope you found this helpful. Please like and subscribe, and I'll catch you in the next video.